Are you conservative? Sick of your family and friends? Making fun of you for having bad opinions? Are you tired of cabals of international bankers? Do you find yourself increasingly surrounded by degenerates? Looking for a final solution to your problems? Well, girl, look no longer, because we have the ideology for you. Fascism for women. DM. Love the idea of systematically murdering your political opponents, but you're afraid of looking like an evil monster? Hide behind the veil of white feminism with fascism for women, TM. White feminism allows you to sound progressive while actually upholding white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. Because girls, we've had enough of being a male boot stamping on a human face forever. It's time we put on our nine inch heels and did some of that stamping ourselves. Also forever. Our unique blend of fascism and white feminism conveniently lets you speak openly about wanting minorities and dissenters dead without worrying about those pesky stress-induced wrinkles caused by being tried at the Hague for crimes against humanity. Fascism for women, TM. This guy's all hateful rhetoric behind a big vagina-shaped shield, so anyone questioning your motives must accept that you, a white woman, couldn't possibly be advocating for genocide. Our solution works on sexist men who think women are incapable of being evil, naive centrists who think that white women are inherently enlightened just for being exposed to sexism, and hate groups who are just happy to have someone else out for the blood of black, brown, queer, and disabled people. Move over, blood and soil. It's time for gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. Ask your local national front member if fascism for girls could be the right choice for you. From the company that brought you Adolf hit her, Benito Pussolini, and Augusto Pino Slay. This year, fascism finally comes home, but this time, the future, and fascism, is female. Bravo, bravo, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you to this week's sponsor of the Empire Statement, Fascism for Women, TM. In honor of this wonderful occasion, this time, we're going to be talking about girl power. And by girl power, I mean girls seeking absolute power and domination for the white race. You know, like everyone's favorite historical figures did. My name is Bridget Empire, a white woman and distinguished columnist, and definitely not a disabled transsexual socialist who is terrified of being put into some kind of labor camp. And in honor of everyone currently celebrating the new frontier of girl bossing under Giorgia Maloney and her as yet unyassified party, Brothers of Italy, more like Sisters of Italy, this is the Empire Statement. Part 1 Gaslight A Brief History of Fascism. Well, here we are. You know, as someone working in the British media, I knew this day would come one day. The Daily Mail used to publish Adolf Hitler's diaries, you know, and now the Daily Telegraph is going to have the honour of promoting the next stage in the all-out war on, well, everyone. So, let me give you a rundown of how we got here. The latest developments in female-fronted fascism, how they disrupt the limits of so-called identity politics to solve social issues, and how the woke mob will try to fight back against this new wave of white women who are just empowered enough that they'll fight to ground everyone underneath them on the social hierarchy into a fine powder and snort it for pleasure. <sniffs> Delicious. Fascism, as a concept, was birthed in the early 20th century by a bunch of stinky men who unfortunately, given they had penises and XY chromosomes, yuck, were unable to effectively girl boss, eventually leading to the defeat of fascism by the combined might of the USR, the UK, and the USA in World War II, along with a bunch of brown people that my employers would like us to forget about. If we conveniently ignore Franco and Salazar, that is, who ruled Spain and Portugal into the 70s as explicitly fascist regimes, but that's messy, that's too messy as well as the multiple fascist dictators installed by the West in Latin America and Asia, when the locals in those countries got some funny ideas about the poor not starving to death for the sake of lining the pockets of American billionaires. You know, that had to be done, obviously. 
fascism can be fairly hard to define, as its political tendencies do vary from country to country and leader to leader, but generally, fascist ideology relies on, according to Umberto Eco's Earth Fascism, 1. The culture of tradition. One has only to look at the syllabus of every fascist movement to find the major traditionalist thinkers. The Nazi gnosis was nourished by traditionalist syncretistic occult elements. Number two, the rejection of modernism, the enlightenment, the age of reason, is at the beginning of modern depravity. In this sense, earth fascism can be defined as irrationalism. Number three, the cult of action for action's sake, action being useful in itself, and must be taken before or without any previous reflection. Thinking is a form of emasculation. Number four, this agreement is treason. The critical standard distinctions and the distinguishing society modernism, and modern culture and scientific communities praise the disagreement and the rage of Number five, the difference of fascist theory fascism over kind of fascist movement, including 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 Fascism is a far-right ideology revolving around the idea of returning to a fictitious past of paradise in a nation's history. Where conservative traditions are abound, the traditional social hierarchy is strict and violently upheld by a powerful police state, and changes to this ultra-conservative way of life are violently crushed, including entire ethnic and social groups that do not fit this imagined cultural ideal. Oh, you're Jewish? Sorry. Our imaginary paradise is for Christians only. Bad luck. Oh, you're a traveller? Sorry. Our imaginary paradise is only for nuclear families in stationary homes. Historically, fascism gained power in an environment where a general fear of communism was, was spreading among the ruling classes, as the results of the Russian Revolution of 1917 sent shockwaves around the world. Winston Churchill famously once said that he thought Mussolini was a boss-ass bitch, and that he'd much prefer fascism to communism and Mussolini over Lenin. While you can debate whether fascism would have emerged without the spectre of communism haunting Europe, as Karl Marx and Friedrich Eagles put in the Communist Manifesto, the first major fascist parties, and Mussolini and Hitler both, define themselves in opposition to Marxism directly, adopting some popular policies to attract a mass base while supporting a hyper-conservative agenda of ethno-nationalism defined against a large and hostile underclass. The thing is, Fascism in the 20th century just wasn't marketable to women, you know. Gabriele D'Annunzio, considered by some to be the inventor of fascism itself, and certainly the first to establish a quasi-fascist state, was a notorious sex pest who wore shoes shaped like literal penises, ghosted practically everyone he slept with, including his wives, plural, and was obsessed with the violent rape of multiple peasant women. By annexing the then Yugoslav city of Rijeka, or Fiume for the Italians, D'Annunzio directly inspired the fascist movement in Italy, especially considering he was one of the most famous poets of the Italian language of all time, to the point where later in his life he accused Mussolini essentially of stealing all of his ideas. But let's be honest, babe, the dick shoes? Not a great look. Is it fashion? Yes. Is it appealing to your core demographic? Well. Clearly not enough to retain control over a large city, which is now one of, if not the most left-wing city in the modern state of Croatia, so maybe we need to work on the marketing just a little bit. As part of its cult of tradition, fascism as a rule is very anti-women's liberation and women's rights, often explicitly calling for fewer women in workplaces, abortion bans and birth control bans. All policies adopted by the Italian fascist party. As a result, most women just aren't down with fascism, as it would obviously reduce their power and privilege in society. But the solidifying power and privilege in, for example, whiteness, can be enough to persuade some white women, who identify more strongly with their race and with their sex, to advocate for fascism, the fear of a world where other races and cultures are equal to them, taking white women from a place of relative privilege, as members of the dominant class, to on par with black and brown women. Now, you might suggest, that perhaps white women should have solidarity with black and brown women for their shared struggles. But some people just love the taste of boot, especially when they can go from licking their husband's boot to putting that boot on and stepping on racialized and working class women, who they expect to do all of the jobs they don't want to do and cease exercising their right to make decisions about the way society should be run. Dan, please don't make me cut that. I know a bunch of our readers of cleaners and household staff, but that's exactly my point. If you're the kind of person that's cleaning toilets instead of ordering your other people to clean your toilet, then... You're able to make a distinction between yourself and the rest of society. You're one of the in-crowd, not one of them. What, so the word privilege is banned now? No, I don't want to lose my job. Okay, okay, I'll skip the history. Clearly you're not interested in my takes on the role of anti-fascist women in the Yugoslav partisan movement. Fine. Back to my propaganda, I mean, program. Part two. Gatekeep. How the right weaponized identity politics. Following the crushing defeat of Mussolini and Hitler in World War II, new fascist regimes in the 20th century tended to be military dictatorships, with all the machismo you might expect from such a group. These days, however, a new phenomenon is emerging and sweeping across the world. In the 21st century, women can now vote, 
and now you have to persuade them to vote for you if you want power without having to stage a coup, and coups are pretty difficult to organise and can be bloody. What better way then to persuade women that fascism might be a good idea, actually, than to have one of them at the helm of your movement? Want to murder your political opponents and ship off immigrants to concentration camps, but scared that governments advocating for these positions might go after you next? Well, worry no longer, because a woman is heading this organisation. Now you can be reassured, as long as you are straight, white, cis, Christian and far right, it'll be safe to be a woman in the brave new world we're promising. Now help us come set up the gallows, this is where we'll hang the gender traitors. The interesting thing about this development is the incorporation of modern views of gender and the place of women in society into this vision of a hyper-traditionalist, conservative hellscape, sorry, ethnostate. You see, often liberation movements in capitalist societies start off with very radical aims, which are often disavowed by successive movements in the decades following as a result of integration and acceptance within the current system gained by the radical actions of those in previous generations. Capitalist societies have become extremely good at both accommodating and swallowing criticism, allowing, for example, votes for women after violent direct actions such as bombings by the suffragette movements, by appealing to their more upper class elements and ignoring their more radical members, implementing civil rights for black people, while at the same time absolutely obliterating black liberation movements and black communist movements such as the Black Panther Party in the USA, and after decades of struggle for queer rights, allowing gay marriage and heavily gatekept transition related services baiting the more straight-passing and traditionalist wings of the gay liberation movement and causing them to turn on their more radical sides. Abolish the family? No, not anymore. We can make our own nuclear families just like the straights, and that's kind of what we wanted anyway. Your demand's gonna have to wait. Abolish gender? No thanks. I got the gender I wanted. I can't risk that being taken away from me just so you can have an X on your passport. At the forefront of so many of the civil rights struggles of the 20th century were radicals, demanding real, systematic change reimagining of the social and economic conditions that oppress us. And they were all forgotten, pushed aside, whitewashed, killed, or some combination of the above. Think about how many people don't know that Martin Luther King, for example, was a socialist. Or how many articles have been written about the current struggle for trans rights by some columnist insisting that the gay rights movement only ever asked nicely for change. Or the suffragettes were a good example of peaceful protest working. <laughs> The suffragettes literally blew shit up, they killed people! Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated because he was seen as a threat to the powers that be. And now conservatives act as if my MLK were around today, he'd be on Fox News denouncing the woke karate and spouting, Q and spouting QAnon shit. New Left in the 20th century certainly did an amazing job, fighting for rights for various minority groups in the face of violent opposition. But in the end, when we were in a place for our demands to be met, proper, liberatory demands, our more conservative wings accepted integration instead of opposition, fitting into the established range of possibilities offered to us instead of expanding the possible. In other words, identity politics focused on acceptance and integration and abandoned its wings that were focusing on solidarity and liberation. This only perpetuates the very systems that suppress the identities we are fighting to keep be accepted to begin with. And this can result in some really weird outcomes from LGB Alliance to Candace Owens to Marianne Le Pen and Giorgia Meloni. Reactionary conservatism with a progressive face, essentially. If you listen even a little bit, you can see what it is. But the optics seem to present fascism with a friendlier face. As friendly as that face may seem, though, be careful. It still wears the same jackboots as its forebearers. The current crop of faces serving as the fresh, diverse new look for fascism are the real version of the character of Stormfront from The Boys. If you've not seen this show, The Boys is a satirical superhero show based off the comic book of the same name. In season 2 of the show, the character of Stormfront is introduced to fill in an empty slot on a heavily corporate superhero team, while initially presented as a disruptive countercultural breath of fresh air with an incredible social media game that her fans eat up, well, her name is Stormfront. It turns out she's an unaging, super-powered, literal Nazi, like the German kind, from World War II. And she uses modern sensibilities to convince normal people that she's on her side, so they'll be more accepted to her true motives, which are literally the same motives as Adolf Hitler. This, this show is completely on the nose, and it's great. Uh, since The Boys is a satire, this has played it to the maximum, with Stormfront teaming up in an in-universe movie with the other women on her superhero team, probably the slogan, Girls Get It Done. Later on, the same phrase is employed by one of the titular boys when she finally gets her Nazi face punched in by her former teammates. Girls do get it done. 
One of the other heroes, Maeve, even has a whole character arc about relearning to show solidarity with Starlight, her teammate, in the face of her mistreatment at the hands of the male members of the team. The boys highlights both the potential for good and the potential for evil of identity politics. Stormfront uses the fact that she's a woman to make people let their guard down. For her, identity politics only go as far as giving her enough power to disempower others. For Maeve and Starlight, their politics aren't limited to individual empowerment, but for solidarity, not just with each other, but for others, for people who need help, the Starlight especially, filling the role of the platonic ideal of a superhero. Righteous, empathetic, understanding, and willing to fight for what is right, in a world that is constantly trying to push her over the edge, a world where the deck is comically stacked against anyone with her moral compass. And if you're going to be fighting struggles for marginalised identities today, you're going to have to have that same fortitude. The more we fight and win, the more the far right will try and co-opt our wins and turn them against us. There will always be people willing to sell out their siblings to get a seat at the table of the powerful, and we have to be ready for that, and insist on fighting anyway. Ring ring, ring ring. Shit, ring ring, ring ring ring. Hello? No, I, I, di I didn't accidentally hear left winger on again. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I heard nothing but praise for the right on my end. Dan, did you hear any anti for nonsense just now? See, Dan heard nothing either. You might need to get your ears tested, my darling. Yes, I'll, I'll make sure it never happens again. Goodbye. Okay, so maybe I've gone a little bit off message, but can you blame me? When I was told I got this job, I thought to myself, well, I might have to fluff up some unsavory characters every now and again, but come on, it's not like they'll have me defending literal fascists. In any case, the larger point still stands. When the woke mob pushes, the real patriots fight back, using their own tools against them. Take that, suffering people, a taste of your own medicine. It's time for you to get a taste of reality. And by a taste of reality, I mean, a couple of you can probably have a job at the Daily Telegraph too if you're willing to completely sell out and compromise on every single one of your principles. Also, please stop asking for more rights. It's making my editors extremely cross. All right, I, I think we've got that covered. Now, for the main course, the current roster of delightful female faces that will happily send you all to death camps. Christ, this job can be grim. Dan, can, can I have some vodka? No, no, not a shot, like a whole bottle. Actually, make that two, and not the good kind, some real Tesco value shit. I want to feel the hangover in the morning so I can have an existential crisis over the mess that is my life. The life of a girl boss. Part three, girl boss. The future of fascism is female. Marine Le Pen, or Marine Le Pen, if you're French, is a French politician who was worrying close to becoming president of France last year. After coming second in the first round, just in front of my boy, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, she lost the incumbent, Emmanuel Macron, in the second round. But she had a lot of supporters, and this is not the first time she's run either. Succeeding her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen, notorious fascist and leader of the National Front, which later changed its name to National Rally, presumably because National Front was a little too obviously fascist, Le Pen has worked hard over the years to present a softer face of fascism to the French public much in the same way that male politicians such as Nigel Farage in the UK and even David Duke of the KKK previously talked about, softening their rhetoric to attract new voices that can be radicalised later on once they're already in the organisation. To this end, she expelled her own father from the party, reversed some of her policy positions on, for example, same-sex marriage, and has expelled party members on occasion for anti-Semitism and other forms of racism when they become too extremely overt about it. These are very similar tactics to those used by fascist parties in the 20th century, offering just enough to get popular support while explicitly keeping the end goal of a hyper-nationalist agenda, but more elastic. In Le Pen's case, she gives the game away pretty clearly in the way that she talks about Muslims, comparing their presence in France to the Nazi occupation during World War II. Unfortunately for us and the voting French public, for those trying to explain who she really is behind the image she presents to the public, Macron does a pretty good job at being a rampant Islamophobe already, which plays right into her hands, making her outright racism against the sizable Muslim population in France seem mainstream. In fact, in the last general election, she was accused by Macron's government of not having a harsh enough immigration plan. The fascist was accused of not having a harsh enough immigration plan. And she was challenged by another far-right politician, Zemmour, who is a subject for another day, but sort of think of him as the French version of Alex Jones. Uh, Alex Jones, I guess. Marine Le Pen's campaign of de-demonization of her far-right party, something an opponent of hers, Bernard-Henri Levé, described as the far-right with a human face, 
is the blueprint for many of the new wave of female fascists, in the same way that Silvia Berlusconi's presidency in Italy, with its open corruption, flagrant sex crimes and outrageously grotesque rhetoric, laid the blueprint for people like Donald Trump and Boris Johnson to play the character of the comedic rogue challenging party orthodoxy years later in their various countries. Marine Le Pen hasn't won the presidency of France yet, but she's come very close and is extremely influential in Europe. In fact, the just elected Prime Minister of Italy, Giorgia Maloney, was being described prior to her election by a bunch of news outlets as Italy's Marine Le Pen. Except, unlike her French counterpart, Maloney actually won. And as usual, the woke left hates to see a girl boss winning. Well, it's time to cope and see, woke moralists. Giorgia Maloney is your new goddess now. Yes, she's a fascist, but I thought you were pro-women in power. Well, look who's anti-woman now. Meloni is here. Her name is like melon, but with an I on the end. I for Italy, of course. Her favourite thing. She leads the Brothers of Italy, but she's not a brother. Because she's just one of the guys, you know. One of the guys. You know, Salvini. Berlusconi. Mussolini. The guys. Hey, I win the election. I scrap the benefits. You know, you know, we here at the Daily Telegraph used to think that Italy was all spaghetti this past that, but it turns out it's spaghetti this, racism that, and that's amazing, because for ages racism was just our thing, you know, good old British racism, the envy of white supremacists the world over because we controlled a third of that world. It's good to know that even as Britain plunged into recession and decline, good old British values are still being upheld by our brothers in the Brothers of Italy. Dan, is that actually the name of the party? Am I allowed to make a Mario Brothers joke? Oh come on, why don't we do the good guys in that game, it'll be fun. Giorgia Maloney, in a way, is the epitome of the Le Pen model of fascism. Hillary Clinton even praised her for being Italy's first female prime minister, saying that electing the first woman to the post was certainly a good thing. Hillary Clinton? That one! Maloney has been active in far-right circles since the early 90s, as the inspiration porn videos of her girl bossing her way into neo-fascist Italian social movements will youth wing attest to. They said she couldn't possibly be a bloodthirsty fascist because she was a woman. Well, she showed them. Maloney holds such principled feminist policy positions as banning abortion and says that she's not a feminist at all. And in fact, has suffered racism from feminists. Imagine Maloney, a white woman, facing racism. Because I can't. Maloney endorses and espouses the great replacement conspiracy theory. The idea that white people are being systematically replaced by people of colour for some reason, and has repeatedly referred to plots by George Soros and globalists. And you know, we have a lot of fun here, but she means the Jews. When people say Soros and globalists are behind everything there, they're talking about the Jews. She's a fascist. She wants a zero tolerance policy on immigration, which is insane, and has previously praised OG fascist Benito Mussolini as a good politician. Everything he did, he did for Italy. As much as Maloney's policy positions are pretty clear cut, she does the Le Pen thing, where she downplays explicitly saying she's a fascist, and does the absolute bare minimum to distance herself from the previous fascist regime in Italy, while at the same time saying basically all of the same things as them. So fascists are voting for her knowing she's a fascist, while other people can put enough distance between her and the original fascist part go, well, it's not like she's a fascist. Little, given how little time Maloney has had in office yet, it's not clear how much of her agenda she'll be able to carry out. But the very first thing she did when she got into power was to move to scrap unemployment benefits, so it's probably not going to be great. In addition, Maloney will not be the last person to win on these grounds. Every election cycle, France gets closer and closer to electing an outright fascist. Hungary and Poland already have far-right governments with explicitly anti-woman, anti-LGBT and anti-Semitic policies, and the rest of Europe is barely even the far-right threat from sizzling over. Sweden might just have done this thing now with a new government depending on how it turns out. The influence of the far-right in Europe is growing, and that's something we haven't really seen on this scale since the 1930s, even when the United States was actively trying to make it happen in the 20th century with Operation Gladio, with a bunch of stay-behind networks of the CIA trying to make sure communists didn't get in electoral positions. That really happened, look it up. It's not just the Global South where the CIA decided democracy was bad, actually. This time, however, the Italians seem to have done it themselves. This didn't even happen with Mussolini. This time there's a popular mandate. 
And even though millions of Italians didn't vote for her, and millions still didn't vote at all, it's still really scary, actually. By following the playbook of semi-successful fascists like Marine Le Pen, Giorgio Maloney is the newest and most concrete success story of what has been termed post-fascism. This isn't to say that Maloney isn't a fascist politician, but that in the 21st century, the new wave of fascists take measures to mainstream fascist talking points, taking the cause of some of the most controversial ideas when talking to mainstream audiences, while playing up the similarities with already accepted social norms to give themselves the appearance of being acceptable, part of the mainstream, and most importantly, non-threatening. Post-fascism was successfully applied by Le Pen multiple times in the last decade, with the popularity with the French electorate increasing, as Emmanuel Macron's disastrous policies undermined the legitimacy of mainstream politicians. And with Maloney's win, it's proven that it can do more than just push right-wing parties further to the right, as Nigel Farage successfully did with his UKIP and Brexit parties in the UK, it can win elections outright. This, unfortunately, is a version of fascism we will be seeing a lot more of in the future. As MIA once said, live fast, die young, bad girls do it well, and well, if Maloney is anything like Mussolini, people will die young. Oh fuck. Dan? Dan, can we please change the subject? Is this what being a girl boss means now? Fascism? Ugh. Can we at least talk about Britain? That always lifts my spirit. Oh, thank God. Okay, well, now, while Britain's current girl boss PM, probably XPM, let's be honest, by the time this video comes out, is less menopausal Mussolini, and more freedom with the fanny, there is a consistent fascist undercurrent in the UK that not even the supposed progressive newspapers in this country dare to criticise. No, not Pretty Patel. She's almost certainly a fascist yet, but she's not a movement by herself, and for now, she's on the conservative backbenches. For now. No, I'm talking, of course, about the brave parade of girl bosses known as the Gender Critical Movement, and its dark lord, Jowling, Cowling, Rowling. No, 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 Dan, no, Dan, come back, come back. Hear me out, hear me out, and don't call my editors. Let me explain. As YouTuber Sean's recent video, JK Rowling's New Friends excellently outlines, JK Rowling keeps the company of several people who explicitly wish for the complete eradication of trans people. I'm sure by this, they mean we all end up back in the closet, but what happens when we don't go back willingly? JK Rowling this week declared that innocent until proven guilty should not be applied as a principle to trans people implying that as a demographic, we should be presumed guilty of some sort of crimes. And if you paid attention to the gender critical rhetoric around bathrooms and self-ID laws, you'll know what they think trans people are guilty of, and it rhymes with grape. In fact, the way that Rowling and her compatriots talk about trans people has some striking similarities with the way that post-fascists such as Le Pen and Maloney talk about Muslims as invaders, encroaching on spaces meant for straight white women. Riloni, in the run-up to the election in Italy, even shared a video on Twitter of an asylum seeker raping a woman, implying that allowing immigrants into her country would put women at more risk of sexual assault, which is the same argument Rowling and her compatriots use for not going forward with legislation to make life easier for trans people. In fact, the BBC of all outlets, once praised for being impartial by many people of all factions, previously published an article called we are being pressured into sex by some trans women, in which they implied that women as a demographic feel threatened by the existence of trans women, based on a Twitter poll by a gender critical activist. And for this article, they interviewed a sex worker who was literally guilty of raping multiple women, admitted as such, and following the release of the article, called for the executions of multiple trans women and their allies via lynching. Now, this is all quite extreme, no? You would think, therefore, that like Marine Le Pen, they would have to tone down some of this rhetoric to convince people that they are sensible enough to be handed power, but in this case they don't really, because trans people are still an acceptable target for this kind of dangerous frothing at the mouth criticism. For the British media, the baseline evidence needed to bash trans people is exactly zero. The Guardian, once considered one of the most left-leaning newspapers in this country, has published thought pieces practically every week for the last three years calling trans people a threat to women, and they rarely get called out on it. The entire UK media is like this. Yes, even the Daily Telegraph. In fact, somehow, the fact that JK Rowling was previously considered an extremely liberal voice, back when she wrote children's books instead of inciting hatred against transgender people, seems to have insulated her from mainstream criticism for this. Recently, Graham Norton, TV show host and gay icon, was subject to what was supposed to be a gotcha question on the subject of trans rights. 
Norton initially discussed anti-trans bigotry in a general sense, but was asked by the interviewer, it's easy to dismiss this coming from a privileged man, but what about J.K. Rowling? As if the fact that Rowling is a woman makes her inherently free from the biases of privilege. Rowling is white, she's straight, and she's a literal billionaire. She lives in a castle. She's the closest the epitome. She's the closest the epitome of privilege as you can get without having a wanger to complete the set. But unlike her colleagues in the anti-transgender movement, many of whom have said the quiet part out loud far too many times, such as her friends mentioned above, J.K. Rowling does employ the Le Pen school of hiding her power level. Rowling only ever says enough each time to call people to action, and always stops herself before saying anything too especially obviously hateful, at least to her audience. Trans people and those that care about us can clearly see what she's doing, and she knows it. But the mainstream media is naive enough to buy that she's not threatening us, that she doesn't hate us, and they do exactly the same thing with people like Marine Le Pen and Giorgio Maloney. It's easy to get away with hate campaigns, with exterminationist rhetoric, and build a fascist movement behind you to get rid of the people you deem the outgroup, in other words, a fascist movement, when your public image and your rhetoric say just non-threatening enough to be a dog whistles to your followers and your future victims and background noise to everyone else. Now, these things are not exactly equivalent, don't get me wrong, but the rhetorical devices are similar. The goal is to subjugate minority groups to uphold traditional hierarchies, and the end goal, well, what happens when these movements get what they want? Well, around the same time Rowling insisted that trans people should be considered guilty of crimes by default, she said in the Sunday Times that Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland, would be held personally responsible for the voyeurism, sexual harassment, assault or rape that would occur if she passed legislation to make getting legal recognition easier for transgender people. If you can put two and two together, you can see that trans people are being accused of a bunch of horrific crimes here with no evidence at all. And according to Rowling herself, trans people should be considered guilty of these crimes by default. Now, before I get sued, I'm not saying Rowling or anyone associated with her is a fascist. What I am saying is that this is, this is the kind of rhetoric fascists have historically and now currently use to achieve exterminationist ends. As the new era of post-fascism in Europe has proven, fascists are more and more often presenting a softer and more acceptable face to the public to push their usual all too familiar deadly agenda. If Rowling is not sympathetic to fascism, it's telling that the rhetoric and language of post-fascism is barely distinguishable from the rhetoric her new friends are espousing, to absolute silence from the British media. Which is of course why, obviously, JK Rowling is not a threat to anyone. Look at her, she's just a woman with an opinion. Like our new friend in Italy, Giorgia Maloney. Look at how powerful she is now. Yes, queen, slay, literally. Jealous of their success, woke left? Well, why don't you do something about it? Why not be a hater full time? Why not campaign with people opposing their ideas if you hate to see a girl boss winning so much? Why don't you? If trans people are so scared of Rowling, they can just leave the country or go back in the closet or something else that gets them out of the way of her and her crusade to protect real women. A crusade like the one Maloney would like or Le Pen would advocate for, which, when you think about it, would be a lot like the actual crusades, violent tragedies which should never have been allowed to happen. Dan, oh, oh my god, Dan, you can't keep doing this. What, I'm not allowed to be anti-crusades anymore? Really? Well, I'm going to have to keep up with our editorial line a little bit more. Any, histor any more historical accuracies I should be dated about before I'm forced to defend them? Oh, how did I know you were going to say that one? Listen, no matter how much Lord Nunt's body pays me, I'm not going to do that. Fine, I'll never talk shit about JK Rowling or even the Crusades again. Is that okay? Good. Can we keep in the bit where I did the terrible Italian accent? Good, okay. So, on the list of things that are okay in our editor's books, that's a yes to laughably bad cultural stereotypes and a no to criticising literal fascism. God, do I love the British media. So, Dan, which one of our line of possible Liz Trust replacements would be the most likely to pull a pen and just go outright fascist on us? How about you, Deviewer? What do you think? Please place your bets on how long our country will last in the comments. That'll cheer us up after a terrifying few weeks in Britain. Until next time, then, Poppets. Thanks for watching. Hey, this was a long one and a pretty pressing subject. If you like that, 
uh, give me a pound or so on Patreon. The pound is worth nothing and that's where my Patreon starts. And if you contribute it, you'll get your name read at the end and help me do this more often and with better equipment. And that's patreon.com slash B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E-E-M-P-I-R-E. Uh, one-time donations and coffee, if you just want to make a one-time donation, that's coffee.com slash uh, B-R-I-G-I-T-T-E-E-M-P-I-R-E. And I have a podcast with my friend Luxander that you can check out. That's at soundcloud.com slash MKG podcast. It's quite good. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I love you all. I love you all. And especially, I love my patrons. I love them more than you. But I could love you just as much if you join them. Those patrons are, of course, Scarjan, Naranir, Naomi Wayne, and Joey Cobalt, and Charles TSMTMS. Those sexy names. Could your name be as sexy as those? Find out by bonging a bob to. What was the thing they said? Bang a bob for Big Ben to bong and. Br- 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 Jesus fucking Christ. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>